You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. And that puts a different set of obligations on them in terms of what data they are allowed to keep and what data they must keep and for how long and in what format and so on. And that's really where PST files start to become a problem. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. This morning, Ben has the story about the European Union considering a mandate for common chargers for all phones. I've got the story of an Uber driver in the UK getting locked out of his account because of facial recognition software. And later in the show, my conversation with Paul Robichaud from Quest Software. We're going to be discussing how government agencies can better protect citizen data. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCore Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. All right, Ben, let's jump into some stories here. Why don't you start things off for us? So last week we ragged on Facebook. Uh, (laughs) So I feel like this week we have to pick on a different big tech company. Um, And our story this week uh, relates mostly to Apple. It's from the New York Times, and it's entitled, In a Setback for Apple, the European Union Seeks a Common Charger for All Phones. Mm -hmm. It's by uh, Elian Peltier. Mm. Uh, The European Union, through the European Commission, is considering a new piece of legislation which would regulate uh, the charging ports for all smartphones, tablets, and other electronic devices. All of those devices would be required to have a jack for USB-C cords. Mm -hmm. Uh, Apple is, of course, not happy about this because they've moved on to greater and Bigger and better things in terms of chargers, as Apple is wont to do. Uh, They've decided that the chargers that have sustained us through uh, smartphones 1.0, 2007 to to 2017 or so, um, are no longer sufficient. And uh, they've employed a a sleeker, uh, more efficient charger. Yeah, the lightning port. The lightning port, exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, so this decision would hurt Apple the most. I think most other devices, whether they are tablets, smartphones, etc., uh, wouldn't be affected by the European Commission uh, or the European Union's decision here 
because they already use this uh, common charging port. Mm. Apple, of course, is not happy about this. They're going to lobby hard uh, to the European Parliament, which would have to approve this new regulation. Right. Uh, And my instinct is that the law is still going to pass. We're going to get into a situation where Apple wants to maintain these sleek charging uh, apparatuses, apparati. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah. Devices. Uh, yeah. Wants to, a- Gadgets. And, <laughs> right. And they're worried that uh, regulations like the one in Europe are going to stifle innovation. Ah, uh, yes. And are going to prevent us from having the most efficient technology for charging our devices. Okay. I don't think that's a, a concern that's beyond the pale. I mean, I think it's uh, completely legitimate. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not just Apple saying this. Other tech experts have railed against this potential regulation saying, who knows what the charging technology is going to be in five years? Why should we lock in to this charging port? Yeah. On the other hand, (laughs) uh, I was in a situation yesterday where I have a uh, MacBook Air, which does not have a USB port. Mm -hmm. I was uh, at a conference trying to give a presentation and... Had to go searching for an adapter cable, Mm. Uh, and that's no fun. And that's something that uh, all Apple users are used to. And so I can see why the European Union and the European uh, Commission, representing its constituents, wants to uh, standardize this, wants to make it so that your drawer full of old chargers doesn't become obsolete. So you're really dealing with competing, uh, you know, rather compelling policy objectives here. On the one hand protecting the consumer from having to constantly purchase uh, new products, and then sustaining innovation uh, in in the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think in the United States, we generally in these types of disputes come down more on the side of the industry and in trying to sustain innovation. Right. Um, and that's not just true for the tech industry. It's true for healthcare. It's, it's true for a bunch of different sectors. It's just part of our political culture. Um, what I am somewhat concerned about is we get to a situation in five years where Apple has to produce separate devices for its European customers than from its U.S. customers and its customers in in other countries, Mm. which could be, you know, could have an upward uh, effect on consumer prices, first of all, uh, and, you know, also might be just kind of an undue burden on on the company itself. So it'll be an inter- it'll be interesting to watch. The regulation has not yet been enacted. Mm-hmm. Um, they are uh, the European Commission, which is kind of the bureaucratic arm of um, the EU, is, is still considering the uh, proposal. Um, but it's certainly something to watch out for. My sense on this, I, I and and I generally. Uh, I'm an Apple fanboy. I guess it's fair to say. Yeah. I, oh, I me enjoy too. their devices and have for a long time. But I think in this case, Apple doth protesteth too much. Uh, <laughs> I yes. think they they have already started switching some of their iPads to USB C. So it, it's it's not like even within the company they're holding fast that uh, that Lightning is the superior connector, the one connector to rule them all. You know. Um, and of course, their laptops have USB C. Many of their um, most recent laptops use USB C for charging. Right. So Apple is on board with that to a certain degree. Um, I think there's an argument to be made that Apple wants to stay with Lightning because Apple owns Lightning, and so every app, every cable that's made by anyone that has a Lightning connector on it, Apple makes a little money off of that. So. They're uh, with not without their own financial interest in keeping Lightning a thing. Uh, certainly not. Yeah, that is, that is absolutely correct. I mean, they're not coming at this from. They might talk about innovation publicly. That's going to be their public justification mm-hmm. for opposing this law. We know what their private justification is, which is yes, they own uh, a portion of this technology. They're making money off of it. Yeah, uh, and you know. Part of Apple is, um, you know, coming up with the next best thing. And if they have sometime over the next five to ten years something beyond a lightning connector, um, a technology that doesn't even exist yet, they don't want to have to be constrained by a European Union regulation way back in 2021. Yeah, <laughs> where dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. Um, 
you know, I, I think there are a couple of other criticisms of this law beyond what it would do to Apple. Yeah. Um, one of them is that this is coming too late uh, because the use of these USB-C uh, connectors have actually decreased mm-hmm. um, over the past several years. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I think that's certainly a legitimate criticism. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, is it, I guess, on, on, from a broader perspective, and I don't think this is an answerable question— is it the job of any governing agency to make hard and fast rules for device connectors? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, we've got standard wall outlets for electricity. You know, I mean, there, there's a standard uh, um, gas tank. You know, <laughs> interface between the gas pump and your car. So, not to get too philosophical, though, but those are public goods. Um, you know, you get electricity from the public electric grid, so it has to be. You have to have the same, you know, yeah, uh, uh, placement of holes in the outlet, right? Uh, whereas, you know, that's not necessarily the case with a bunch of different devices that are all privately owned and operated. These are not public utilities yeah. yet. Uh, you know, despite what Justice Thomas says, these are not yet considered even common carriers. Mm-hmm. So, what place does any governing body have to to regulate this if it's not, you know, a, a health and safety issue, which it is not. Right, um, right. I, I don't come down on, on either side of this issue. I just think that's, uh, you know, going to be a source of the debate here. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with the, the, um, the philosophical side of saying that it could hurt innovation. I think that's a legit beef here. Um, my personal take is that I don't see over the next few years – having to use USB-C, given the specs of USB-C with what it can do in terms of both power and data transfer, I don't see that as being a huge limiting factor in in how we're going to be using our mobile devices for the foreseeable future. Um, I tend to think that Apple is moving away from having any ports on their devices, that, um, you know, they got rid of the he- headphone jack. They've put... Uh, the charger on the back of the uh, the phone, the um, I forget what their name is for their wireless charging uh, protocol, but I could see them just sealing the whole thing off. You know, <laughs> take 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 the waterproof uh, ability to the next level, not have any ports at all, charge it wirelessly, and then have all of the data connection happen wirelessly as well. So if, I think. It would I, I I don't know the answer to this, but is is the is the EU requiring a charge port at all? If must they have a port on these devices? I don't know the answer to that. So actually, the article mentions that wireless chargers would not be affected, hmm. um, but for any iPhone or Apple device that uses a Lightning charging port um, that's proprietary to Apple, uh, there there would be an effect. Also, I should note that this law wouldn't come into effect uh, at the earliest until 2024 mm-hmm. um, because of just the process of going through the European Commission and European Parliament. Yeah. So we're still a couple of years away from this being operational, but it's certainly something that we're going to uh, have to keep an eye on. <laughs> I just I love the idea that maybe Apple could go totally bonkers and just put both ports on the phone. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Know, that'll never happen, but it's a funny thing to consider. <laughs> wave my American flag and say, in America, right. we can use both ports. That's right. That's For you right. lowly Europeans, you have to be stuck with the wireless charger. That's right. And the, the new phones, iPhones will have, uh, you know, light, super lightning or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Super American lightning. Right. Yeah. The USA, Captain America lightning USA, port. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. All right. Well, it's an interesting thing to follow. I, I, I like the overall policy issue here, I think, is particularly interesting of, you know, the U.S. The, or the EU, rather, uh, trying to do something for the sake of consumers. But, um, yeah, I think there's a legit concern here that it could limit uh, innovation. Absolutely. So, yeah. All right. Well, my story this week, uh, this comes from uh, The Guardian, and uh, this is about an Uber driver, uh, or should I say an ex-Uber driver, <laughs> who has taken legal action against Uber uh, because evidently Uber uses facial recognition software to allow Uber drivers access to the app. And uh, this gentleman, who is uh, one of a group of people, this article points out that at least 35 other drivers have had their registration with Uber terminated because this facial recognition software uh, is unable to identify them. Now, Ben, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to get you. I'm going to ask. I'm going to put you on the spot. 
and ask you to guess uh, what color skin do you think that this Uber driver has that the facial recognition software had trouble recognizing him? Before having read the article, I'd just say based on uh, having read the news sometime over the past, you know, 10 years, I'm going to guess it was a person of color. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> what do correct. I win for <laughs> that, for that innovative guess yes, there? Yes, you get a free CyberWire uh, sticker. So yes. there you go. <laughs> Put on your laptop. Yes, the coveted uh, CyberWire sticker. Uh, so uh, this – now, uh, this gentleman says that uh, he tried to log in multiple times, was refused – uh, received a notice from Uber saying that his account was terminated. Um, Uber says that they strongly refute uh, completely unfounded claims and that they are committed to fighting racism and being a champion for equality, both inside and outside their company. They say that these checks were designed to protect the safety and security of everyone who uses the app by ensuring that the correct driver is using their account. Now, that's an interesting point here is that uh, – Part of what Uber is using this for is so that someone can't register to be an Uber driver and then have their their best friend or their cousin or their brother or their sister or someone else drive as them. Right. Because that obviously is a safety issue or could be. Uh, you know, Uber doesn't want that. So what do you make of this, Ben? It's really frustrating. I mean, Uber on, uh, you know, Martin Luther King Day in the United States and Juneteenth is going to post statements on social media saying they uh, support racial justice. Yet they're using an algorithm uh, which was devised by Microsoft in which Microsoft admitted that uh, this facial recognition software didn't work as well for people of color and could fail to recognize them. And that's a quote directly from the article. Yeah. Um, and this is not just true, true for this one uh, facial recognition software from Microsoft. It's true, as we've discussed many times, uh, in several face, facial recognition software packages. So it's a persistent problem. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a case that's being brought uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. And it's worth noting that 9 out of 10 Uber drivers in the United Kingdom are black or uh are either uh, of black British ancestry or Asian or, or uh, Asian British ancestry or hmm. mixed race. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not a problem that's going to be confined to a small subset of Uber drivers. Uh, it's going to be relatively widespread because those are the demographics of uh, the drivers in, in uh, the United Kingdom. Hmm. Again, I completely understand that you want some type of uh, algorithm to verify that the person – who is driving the Uber car is who they say they are. Yeah. I understand the safety concerns there. Um, but there has to be a better way. I, I think we could go with the Dave Bittner suggestion where these types of algorithms have to go in front of some sort of regulatory review board. Mm. You set uh, actionable standards. Um, you know, this this algorithm, if it's, if it's going to be approved, uh, this facial recognition software uh, has to pass standards to ensure that it is not racially biased, that it doesn't miss uh, people of color. Yeah, um, I think that is the long-term solution here. Uh, I, I don't know enough about the legal system in the United Kingdom to be a prognosticator, uh, but I, I will say that this is a widespread issue, not just uh, in the United Kingdom, but also in the United States as well. Yeah. I wonder, you know, before we had Face ID, for example, on iPhones, we had Touch ID. Yep. And it was, and it, it remains highly reliable. So why not fall back to something like that? Why not use fingerprints? That we there, there were I, I saw no reports about uh, issues with fingerprint scanning having any sort of racial bias. Right, that is a great question. Uh, maybe because scanning one's finger isn't as cool as having your entire face scanned. It's not a, <laughs> It's not something you're as likely to see in a science fiction movie. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Fair to say, every device has a camera. Right. Right. Not every device has a fingerprint scanner or a face ID scanner. Um, But it's sort of a chicken and the egg problem. You know, the reason that many devices no longer have a uh, scanner for the finger or uh, a touchpad for the finger is because we're using facial recognition. Right. Right. Now, I was curious because part of this article made me think that I had not seen any allegations of racial bias when it comes to Apple's face ID. And I was curious why that is. Uh, And I did a little bit of digging, and I found a couple of articles actually dating back to 2017 
that uh, were asking this very question. And uh, evidently, because Face ID uses infrared to do its scanning, it's not just using the camera on your device, there's a, on your iOS device, there's an infrared scanner, a separate uh, scanner and imager that uh, because it uses infrared, that it doesn't matter what color your skin is. It's basically looking at a heat signature and mapping a 3D image of your face. So it's pretty immune to this bias as well. And, and I wonder, what if someone like Uber who wanted to do something like this said, okay, if you want to be an Uber driver, you have to have an iOS device because we're going to use this. We're going to use Face ID instead of just using the camera on your phone. Would that itself be discriminatory because – Apple devices are more expensive than Android devices, aren't always as readily available. Is that a, as an employer, is it fair for them to uh, make um, a restriction like that saying that it's going to be for security? I, I think it's fair for an employer to do that. They're a private company. I mean, they have other restrictions in terms of which vehicles can be used to transport passengers, for mm, example. Right. Um, I mean, Uber has standards for those. I think it would be reasonable to require that Whatever application uh, or whatever device is being used by drivers, it's one that has facial recognition that's widely recognized as avoiding some of these racial biases. Mm -hmm. If that's something that Uber wants to prioritize. Um, instead, it seems like they're prioritizing fighting this lawsuit, which I understand. Nobody wants to get sued. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if you want to recruit the greatest uh, volume of drivers and a socioeconomically diverse set of drivers, you don't want to confine, confine them to one operating system. And yeah. I understand that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but the reverse of that is by using an algorithm that we, you know, we now know has this, this weak spot for people of color, perhaps it's going to be a disincentive for other people of color to apply to be Uber drivers if they think they're, that they're going to run into this problem yeah. as the individual uh, who was named in this lawsuit. Uh, so it really cuts both ways. That's why I think a broader solution is needed so that you know we have some sort of regulatory agency approving these algorithms, these, the, these facial recognition systems before they go to market, um, that there's some type of institutional review board. It's independent. It's made up of a cross-section of uh, individuals, obviously mostly people who have technical expertise, but mm -hmm. also, um, you know, a shout out to the sociology majors uh, out there who, who, uh, <laughs> right, right, right. who might have a source of employment on, on this type of commission. <laughs> right. I know this is a pipe dream, uh, but that's ultimately the, the, going to be the solution to this problem mm -hmm. is uh, the government stepping in and, and making sure that any algorithm that goes to market doesn't have these, um, you know, racially discriminatory uh, effects. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, we will have a link to that story in the show notes, of course. Uh, we would love to hear from you. If there's an issue that you would like us to cover, or if you have a question for me or for Ben, you can write to us. It's caveat at thecyberwire.com. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. All right, Ben, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Paul Robichaud of Quest Software, uh, and we were discussing some ways government agencies can better protect citizen data. Uh, Paul has some uh, specific ideas about this. Here's my conversation with Paul Robichaud. When you talk about what government agencies need from the cloud, and I guess first I want to start by segmenting off. Let's, let's push the high reliability, high security, DOD, intelligence community. Let, let's kind of push those people to the side because they have their own requirements that are immovable. Right? They're not ever going to adopt a cloud service that doesn't meet 100% of the things that they need. And, and most of them are not using PSTs or other 
technologies like that anyway. Um, but for the majority of government agencies, for people like, you know, the state insurance board or the U.S. Department of the Interior or the Centers for Disease Control, uh, you know, these, these people all have the same problem that we have, which is, or in the commercial world, which is they have a set of services they need to deliver to their end user customers, and they have a finite budget and a finite number of people. And so cloud services are attractive to government agencies for the same reason they're attractive to commercial and educational agencies. The difference is that government agencies have got a slightly different regulatory regime. Many of them have got open records laws that they're required to comply with, for example, that don't apply to CyberWire Daily or to Quest Software or to you know uh, Uncle Joe's Bakery. And that puts a different set of obligations on them in terms of what data they are allowed to keep and what data they must keep and for how long and in what format and so on. And that's really where PST files start to become a problem. Let's dig into that. I mean, what, what are the issues? First of all, can you, uh, for folks who aren't familiar, can you give us a little definition of what PST files are and what's the issue here? Sure. So PST files are the colloquial name for the extension file that Microsoft included in early versions of Outlook. Way back in the day, like mm. decades ago, if you had a 10 megabyte mailbox, you were a king, right? That was like a really big <laughs> right. deal. And so everybody had more email than that. And of course, email message sizes have gotten larger. But even in those days, it was very common for people to need to keep more mail around to do their job than their mailbox size quota would allow. Mm. So Microsoft said, oh, you know what we'll do? We'll give you an offline file format that you can move messages into that'll stay on your local PC. And that way, even if you're only allowed to have 10 megabytes in your real mailbox, you can have PST files on your local workstation or laptop that will hold as much email as you want. And if a PST file gets full, or if you want to start a new one every year or a new one for every project or whatever, you can. And that seemed to work okay until people caught on to all of the record keeping and chain of custody and records management implications of letting every individual person keep some unknown amount of some unknown set of email contents on a machine that wasn't getting backed up wasn't mm. centrally managed, couldn't be participating in discovery requests, and so on. And so is this basically a, I don't know, for lack of a better word, a searchable archive of, of email that, that people have control over on their own endpoint computer then? Yeah, although it, saying it's searchable is exaggerating a little bit because Outlook mm. search doesn't always work as well as anybody would like it to, but at least the intent was to let users have their own user-controlled storage repository where they could keep whatever email they thought was important enough to keep around. So what are the consequences of, of this then? From an organization's point of view, I have a bunch of employees who are basically, uh, you know, dialing in their own amount of, of being a pack rat when it comes to old emails. Uh, how does that affect the organization? Well, the biggest problem that PST files cause for the organization is because they are not centrally managed and centrally searchable, you can't really effectively control what content or how much content people store. And I'll give you an example of why that's bad. There was a case some years ago, ironically involving Microsoft, where Microsoft was sued for doing something anti-competitive. And the plaintiff issued a discovery request that said, hey, Microsoft, you need to give us all of the emails about this bad thing you allegedly did. And so Microsoft went off and they brought back some records and said, okay, judge, this is all the records we have about this thing. And it turned out that the plaintiff had some email that Microsoft did not because they had kept copies in their PST files. Hmm. That turned out to be very bad for Microsoft because then the judge you know, wagged his finger very sternly at them and said, you guys are not playing ball and find them a bunch of money. And there are a number of other similar cases where keeping PSTs around means that when you're compelled to produce some kind of record in a legal matter, you can't guarantee that you've produced everything because these PST files, essentially, as they sit on individual machines, are invisible to e-discovery tools. So yeah. I may have a copy of an email from my CEO telling me to do something really terrible, like kick a puppy, in my PST file. 
Right. And if the judge says, show me all your records relating to puppy kicking, and I don't produce that record, and later it comes to light, say, because the person to whom I sent it has a copy and enters that into the case, now all of a sudden it looks like I'm hiding evidence, even though it may be completely inadvertent. Mm -hmm. Then for government agencies, when you multiply that out, the problem they have is that there are pretty stiff legal penalties for not complying with open records requests. And so, uh, for example, the National Archives and Records Administration in the U.S. is uh, the entity that's responsible for making sure that government agencies keep the amount of data they're supposed to for the right amount of time. And uh, what they've persistently found is that there are federal agencies who have data that they don't know about or who don't have data and don't realize they don't have it because PST files have if I say interfered, that, that sounds bad, but because the PST files represent this sort of black box of you don't know what's in them, you don't know how many of them there are, you don't know who has them, it makes it much harder for an agency to know whether or not they're in compliance or to prove that they are in compliance or to protect themselves from the consequences of not being in compliance. So what are the alternatives out there? I mean, I, I suspect for, for organizations who know that they have an obligation to be on top of this – are there other tools at their disposal? Sure. The best tool that people have at their disposal is to give their users bigger mailboxes. And hmm. Microsoft has done a great job of emphasizing the value behind large, low-cost mailboxes. So the trick there is if you have PST files or you think you might have PST files, when we talk about them at Quest, we usually talk about them in the sense of upgrading your PSTs to the cloud. So you've mm. got some number of PSTs on workstations. Great. What you want to do is you want to grab that content and bring it into people's cloud mailboxes. That way they still have access to the data if they need it for their jobs. But also that way when you do an e-discovery search for puppy kicking or chocolate chip cookie recipe stealing or whatever you know heinous thing you're accused of, right. the right records will show up and the organization will be protected. Plus, there's, a, there's another side to this too that it, it's not a records retention issue per se, but it is an end user productivity and security issue. Because these PST files are portable and because they're typically stored on individual workstations, they tend to not get backed up and they are vulnerable to being lost or stolen. And so if you can imagine somebody who's worked at an agency for 20 years and has you know, PST files yearly from say, I don't know, 1988 to 2012, when they move to a bigger email server, that data may have some intrinsic value and lightning or a spilled Diet Coke or a fire, any number of reasons may cause you to lose that data. And then it's gone mm. because it wasn't protected in the cloud. Then, of course, the other problem that you see is uh, occasionally attacks like the one that Sony Pictures suffered from a few years ago, where an attacker who can compromise a workstation can shoplift the PST files and then read everything that's in them which essentially means they've gotten a copy of you know, that individual's email traffic. Yeah, I mean, how much of this is, is, I don't know, the reality that perhaps email as we know it has sort of outlived its usefulness? You know, it, it seems like it's popular and sometimes fashionable to, uh, to complain about how old and creaky our email system is, and yet we're sort of stuck with it because it's what everybody has and it works. I guess it strikes me that people are using email uh, in a way that it was never designed for. You know, this sort of, this historical record of all of your business interactions, which is what, for a lot of people, email is. Having emails that go back five or ten years. I mean, I, I have emails that are 20 years old. Sometimes it's fun to look back on them, but I guess to your point, shouldn't we be at a, a place where they're automatically getting offloaded to a proper archival system if, if they're important to us? Oh, absolutely. No, that's an excellent point, Dave. If people have done their due diligence around designing their email system, they'll have retention policies in place that will keep the right amount of data for the right amount of time and then get rid of things that are no longer necessary. And mm -hmm. then if people want to, the organization may permit them to say, okay, great. If you have some data that you think is special that you need to keep, then you can tag it to say, don't delete this exempt it from the default retention policy. Microsoft has put a huge amount of effort into designing the tools to enable that and making them accessible and you know, building them into the product, and they work very well. So that addresses a problem once 
you wake up and realize, oh my goodness, people are keeping this data and I don't know where and I don't know how and I don't know how much. So mm -hmm. I want to put some retention controls into place. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that doing that doesn't get rid of, it doesn't make the PST file problem go away. To do that, you have to make the PSTs go away. Is this a, a universal problem here? I mean, if people who are using other service providers, if I'm using Gmail or something like that, are, are there similar challenges all around? Um, I'm going to say not exactly. And the reason for that is the PST file format is a, a child of Outlook for Windows. And mm. so if you have Outlook for Windows talking to Gmail, you could still have a PST file that has data from Gmail in it. Realistically, I, you know, nobody does that, but you could. So the, the big problem that we see are for organizations that had on-premises exchange for a while and it, where employees got into the habit of creating PST files to save data that they thought was important. And now, even if they move to the cloud, they still have this sort of you know toxic waste dump of PSTs scattered throughout the organization that they need to do something to remediate. So what are your recommendations then? I mean, for organizations who want to get on top of this and, and put uh, proper procedures in place, where do they get started? That is a really good question, Dave. The best way to get started is by, first of all, disallowing the creation of new PSTs. Hmm. So there's a registry key that you can set and then distribute through group policy or through the office client policy service that says, hey, you're no longer allowed to create new PSTs with you know file new PST in Outlook. That at least will stop the hole from getting any bigger. It doesn't do anything to address whatever PSTs you, you may have around, but you know at least it doesn't let the problem get any worse. Hmm. Really, the next step after that has to start with educating your users. The simplest, lowest cost migration option is you just tell people, hey, if you have a PST file, you need to grab its contents and drag it into your archive folder in Outlook. Now, the problem is you're asking users essentially to sort of distributively perform a task that really should be centralized, it should be centrally managed. Right. But to centrally manage it and you know, do it the right way, you've got to buy a service or a tool. And I, not every organization is willing to do that or has budget to do that. So one way to start is if you can tell people, hey, if you have old PST files, you know, do something with that content yourself to bring it under management. That's, a, that's a, a decent start. Now, as with any other technical measure, when you ask an end user to do something like that, you'll see adoption on a bell curve. You're going to have mm -hmm. some people who immediately do it because they're comfortable with the technology and they see the value. You're going to have some people who will never do it, no matter what. It's too hard or they hate the IT department or whatever, and they're just not going to do it. And most of the people in the middle will fall into this sort of group where if it seems like a good idea and they have time and it's not too hard and they're not too busy, they'll do it. They don't mind, but it's not going to be a top priority for them. Mm -hmm. So get the easy pickings first, right? Get your early adopters to get off PSTs. But really at the end of the day, you know, Microsoft has a tool for doing PST imports, but frankly, it's not very good. Mm. It doesn't do a good job of discovering PSTs. When it does discover them, sometimes it can't tell who the PST belongs to. And the last thing in the world you want to do is grab a PST and say, oh, this looks like the CFO's email and import it into her mailbox when it's actually from the CEO or a product right. manager or a podcast producer, right? If you right. can't attribute that data, it's worse, much worse to just randomly grab it and put it somewhere. So if that's the only tool you have available, it's probably better than nothing as long as you're careful and judicious about how you use it and how you monitor it. But um you know, really your best bet long-term is going to be to find a vendor or a service that can help you scope the problem to understand where all your PSTs are and how many of them you have and how much data is in them, and then get them securely moved into the cloud so that you can sort of dust your hands together and say, great, problem solved. Ben, what do you think? I really enjoyed listening to the interview. I mean, I think government institutions uh, have unique vulnerabilities. Uh, as a private institution, you certainly have some uh, legal obligations as it comes to data. If you're a healthcare institution, you know, you have to worry about HIPAA. Um, there are lots of uh, different laws that apply in different sectors. 
Um, but for government institutions, uh, you know, you just magnify those concerns tenfold. It's not just HIPAA violations, it's personnel records. Um, so I think that does leave government institutions particularly vulnerable. Um, and, you know, so, so any help that's out there to ameliorate the effects of, um, you know, data breaches or, or data loss um, is, is a good idea. And so uh, I really enjoyed listening to the interview. Yeah. Our thanks to Paul Robichaud from Quest Software for joining us. We do appreciate him taking the time. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.